I'm hoping that the recording for the let's uh let's start going here. Um so while while we still got some people coming in here, we'll do the random quiz questions. We're gonna talk actually about batteries specifically. Um, today, there's some examples of the different types of batteries, alkaline batteries versus lithium ion batteries versus car batteries. Um, so we'll talk, we'll answer that one a little bit, but basically any half cell, just like this week's lab showed, any half cell, any pair of half cells really, can be used to, to make a battery. It's just all, all about how can we get as much energy density as possible, and different batteries are better for different applications. Lithium ion batteries are really good because they provide a pretty constant voltage over the entire discharge cycle. So you're not dropping your voltage constantly, which would make it really, really hard to do a complex circuit like a computer on something where your voltage is changing dramatically by you know, 50% um, over the first you know, 10 minutes that you're using a battery. Uh, that said, something like a car battery, we don't need it to have a constant voltage because we only need to call it once, in theory, um, before it gets recharged. So with car batteries, we want to design something that will discharge a whole bunch of current at a high voltage really quickly. Um, so they're not the same applications. And this is kind of like renewable energy in, in a lot of ways, too. There's no silver bullet solution. There's no perfect battery for all applications. There's no perfect renewable energy source for all applications. They all have their drawbacks, and all of them are going to get used in certain applications. It's more mix and match, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard to replace fossil fuels is because fossil fuels have so much energy density to them that it's really, really easy to engineer ways to use fossil fuels for anything. Um, that's so fossil fuels kind of were a silver bullet solution for energy for a lot of years. And um, because of that pro property, it's harder, it's a trickier problem to try and pick the right battery types and the right renewable energy types based on the applications and the needs and, and the geography, even when it comes to renewables. Um, so it's it's a really interesting problem and one that where there's lots of research being done improving things like discharge rates or keeping voltages constant things like that. Um, let's see. Somebody asked about plastics while we're on the topic of redox reactions. Plastics um, plastics actually do degrade over time. If you've ever had like there's um. You guys remember doing the using those syringes for the gas loss lab where you had to like balance stuff on top of them? Those are a couple of years old. The plastic's starting to yellow a little bit and it gets brittle, right? It's not nearly as flexible. Old plastics tend to get a lot more brittle. Um, and what that? Yeah, cars. Old cars, especially up here at altitude, they tend to degrade, especially when they're exposed to UV light, but it is a redox reaction that's happening. And when you do that, you wind up with um, changing some of the properties. Sometimes you can wind up with plastics curing and actually improve some properties, but sometimes it's causing causes issues um, in a negative way. Um, they what they do, the reason that they last forever in theory is mostly because um, nothing has evolved to digest them yet. Um, no, there's no microbes or anything like that that get in there and cause plastics to rot really yet. They're, they only break down because of physical means like crushing them or chemical means like dissolving them or these redox reactions, things like that. There's no biological means of digesting them yet. Um, although that's changing, um, there are some microbes that have been found in, in certain, some landfills um, where they're finding some um, bacteria that can actually digest certain plastics, certain types of plastics. They're actually learned, have evolved to use it as a food source. Um, it's really analogous to what happened when trees first evolved. If you look at the fossil record back, back before trees, there's a certain, I always mix up what protein it is, but there's a certain protein that's found in, um, in trees that allows them to grow so tall. Um, before that molecule evolved, the only vegetation was like shrub height. Top maximum height of you know five six feet or something like that, um, and then this new polymer developed within the trees that allowed them to grow much higher. But nothing had evolved that could break it down yet. 
So that's actually why there's so much petrified wood in the fossil record is because there was a period of a uh, hundred thousand years, maybe a million years, where trees would fall when they died and nothing would digest them. Nothing, they didn't rot, they just laid there like plastics do in our landfills. Um, and then, but in that case, they got buried under and eventually broken down chemically and then turned into fossils. Um, but it's a really analogous process. What we're seeing with plastics now is just that plastics have only been around for 70, 80, you know, at the end. If you look at natural plastics in, in modern applications, you could argue maybe 100 years, the older rubbers um, were started to become present in about 100 years ago in the 1920s. Um, that's really just not that much time for bacteria and microbes to adjust to digest these new, these new things. Uh, but it is an interesting issue, that, and they are starting to see we're speeding that process up in some ways. But they're actually um, genetically modifying some organisms to be able to digest some of these plastics better, so that they don't, so that they do more naturally degrade over time. Sydney, you kind of answered it. I was just going to ask, like, if you have hope that. It seems pretty. That seems like as far as the types of problems that humanity is facing. Um, digesting plastics seems to be like a pretty easy one to fix, frankly. As if we're, I mean, we're talking about on a global scale, so no problem is easy on a global scale, but that's a lot easier to deal with than, say, climate change. Yeah. Uh, what, what, like, what kind of like byproducts would these bacteria put so on? It would just be like eating anything else, CO2 and water or fermentation process, depending on if there's oxygen around. Um, it's basically just just the way that some, some microbes can digest cellulose, but most can't. Some microbes can digest other, other stuff like these, these plastics, um, and those microbes would wind up you know, being dominant in certain areas where plastics were more prominent, like landfills and things like that. And they could be introduced intentionally um, to try and speed up that process, or we could just let evolution take its course if we have the time for it. And speaking of time, no, okay, hold it till later then. Um, I'm gonna actually have uh, Brad, one of our chemistry, are you officially a chemistry tutor or just math? Just math. Um, I'm gonna yeah. plug you mm -hmm. as, he's taken all of our chemistry courses, so he can help with a lot of the chemistry stuff, even if he's not officially a chem tutor, but he has a visit a uh, stats project, so we're gonna do a quick survey for the for the stats project. We'll, we'll turn it over to you, Tim. So the question is, how many times did you ski or snowboard this season? That's it. Just answer that. It's zero, but zero. Where it what? Where it Did you ski it at all or snowboard? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. You're going to probably be an outlier. You can be outliers. Nice. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a few little in here. So. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And like, they're going to throw off. You're going to have some. Definitely, it might be a fine mobile distribution. You'll have the instructors and then you'll have everybody else. <laughs> I knew there was going to be a good mix here. My stats class was first. Stats wasn't looking too promising. Don't ski. There you go. The school might be hard. What's up? Me? I have skis with no boots. I need new boots. Skiing boots are good. They are. They're very good. They're very you like to, I can't, no, and I probably can't. I'm busy. I got my son's first baseball game this weekend. Oh, nice. So that's stuff. All right, so while that's going around, I'll see you without you. I have done that. I did it last year. Yeah. 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 And we use them in similar applications. It's so a similar called the plastics to the general chemistry. Yeah, okay. It's like it's kind of super super different. Small, we're going to talk about rates today. 
But in general, most of the professor is sort of thing has relative to the quality of the gas curve. Yeah, this there's a white of plastic table there. You should have it's one thing that's burst and destroyed really quickly. I think it's like hoses when you're exposed. I mean, you know, that's the ball of the solution. Yeah, yeah, good question. Fire break. Yeah, that whole section. I mean, and then and then it doesn't get skied out. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going around. I figured we might as well ask answer that last the uh, last random question too. How do glow sticks work at a chemical level? <clears throat> um, the same way the semiconductors work, really, in the same way that a lot of chemical reactions happen. Um, if you have a reaction that has a whole bunch of excess energy and the and the reactant is trying to get rid of, it's not trying to do anything, right? Huh. Well, that's new. Um, interesting. That sucks because today's lecture is going to be awesome. Like in our All right. Room. I don't know what happened there. Um, it looks like everything's still going, though. Um, basically, if you have a reaction that's very highly exothermic, but what that really is typically is a lot of times that means you have excited electrons. And when those electrons fall down to lower energy levels, a lot of times if there's a lot of energy levels that they can go through, um, if there's a lot of energy levels that they can go through, you wind up with them um, making all these really low energy photons. If you have an electron up here that goes here, and then it goes here, and then it goes here, all those, you're gonna make a tiny photon, or you're gonna make a photon every time it makes one of those leaps, right? But if these energy levels are all really close together, then, then you're not gonna make a visible photon, you're gonna make something that's in the IR or, or radio range, even something that's really low in energy, which, usually just gets perceived as heat or we feel it as heat it winds up doing similar things in our body as just like touching something hot just like moving the um, vibration causing additional vibrations in the atoms in our body um which feels like we're getting some something getting warmer that's how microwaves work right it's basically just shining low energy photons on something and when it and when it hits those, it absorbs them. You guys appreciate you. Thank hey, you. No problem. Thank Have a good one. Good luck, you guys. Um, but if it happens to be that this excited reaction doesn't have much in between, you have to go all the way from the high energy state to the lower energy state in one jump, then you wind up creating a photon that might be in the visible range. So all glow sticks really do is that it's a chemical reaction where the, the reaction itself creates this excited state electron, which falls down and creates a photon, just like LEDs. It's the opposite of what happens with, with solar cells, with photovoltaics. Um, it's just a way of doing it in a chemical way rather than an electrical way. Instead of applying a voltage to cause an electron to become excited, you do it by, by having certain chemical reactions where going from reactants to products generates this excited electron which when it falls down creates visible light. Um, and if you can tweak this distance, make it here versus here versus the, this one in the middle, that's how you're gonna get different colors of glow sticks. Different colors of glow sticks basically just work by adding a couple, a couple um, atoms onto the existing molecule, which is the, that reaction is, I believe is, uh, is it fluorescein? Um, but basically, it's based on a molecule that's that's found in bioluminescence in fireflies, which is why the earliest glow sticks, that yellowy green color, is really close to the same color as a firefly, and also really close to the same color as a lot of bioluminescent creatures. Um, it's because it's we base this molecule on molecules that are found naturally in bioluminescent creatures. Um, it's not exactly the same because that's a protein and proteins are much bigger molecules than these, these smaller ones. Um, but it works the same way. If you take fluorescein and you tweak it by adding an atom here and an atom there, changing a nitrogen for an oxygen, things like that, you can adjust these energy levels and give you pink glow sticks versus green glow sticks versus blue glow sticks. 
It's also the same principle that they use for LED TVs, especially the organic LED TVs. Um, organic just means carbon based, right? So it just means that you're not making LEDs out of inorganic molecules, um, you know, um, ionic compounds. If you make um, LEDs out of organic molecules, tweaking an atom here and atom there allows you to basically fine tune this wavelength um, really accurately, which is a pretty useful thing to have. All right, um, and addiction is more complicated, so we'll talk about addiction another time. Um, turns out when you evolve biology, it takes a lot longer to explain things, and it's not as well understood as when we leave all the living creatures out of it. Um, so we'll move on from that since we've already taken 15 minutes on random stuff. Um, so like I mentioned before, we were talking about batteries. Um, you know, the, the actual engineering of a bunch of half reactions to create a usable, rechargeable voltaic cell is really more, it's not a science problem, it's an engineering problem. Engineers take science and they try to make it more useful, get better yields, something that can be sold. Um, so that the average person can use it. Science is more concerned with can we do it or how does it work? And engineering is more concerned with how do we do it efficiently? How do we do it economically? Um, how do we make it so the average person can do it without electrocuting themselves? You can imagine taking, taking what you know about batteries right now and trying to design something that could power a phone. Is a, that's not a science problem. That's an engineering problem. But it's still a problem. It's still hard to solve. So engineering gets conflated with science, but that's kind of a pet peeve of mine because I went to an engineering school for grad school. Engineers are not scientists. Don't let somebody kind of you know try to tell you that an engine. If you're an engineer, you also understand science. It's totally different fields. They just use some of the same techniques, and both involve a lot of math. Um, not to say that I don't love engineers. They're just they just and to think that they understand the science as well as the scientists, and that's not the case. Um, anyway, rant over. Um, the way that a car battery works, is this, this is not just car batteries, this is where you see this type of battery most frequently these days. It's basic, it's got two half reactions, but they both involve making lead sulfate. The oxidation and the reduction both make the same product. Um, which is really handy because it means you don't actually have to physically separate the um, the two half reactions. You don't need a salt bridge in between them. You can let them both be in the same container. You basically just set it up so that you have these, they kind of look like waffle irons, um, where you alternate lead and lead or oxide. And that allows you basically to set up a bunch of these in series. And the thing that about series, and this, if you take physics, when you get to circuits, you'll, you'll learn this or be taught this, um, that if you take batteries and you put them in a series, meaning put them anode of one battery to the cathode of the next battery, if you line them all up like that, you get to add their voltages together. So instead of just having a one volt battery, if you put 10 of them in a row, you get a 10 volt battery. Um, it lowers the total amount of current you can generate sometimes if it's not set up properly. It, it does limit the current. You still have the same total amount of energy. Um, so by doing that, you create a bigger voltage, but at the expense of current. Um, so again, more engineering issues with how to set this up properly, but it's really a pretty ingenious way to do this because for a car battery, you only need to discharge once, again, in theory, assuming your car starts on the first try, but basically you want to give away all your energy very, very quickly um, in a way that you could use to actually physically move something to crank the engine over and start the process of, of the fuel burning. Um, it's not great at keeping voltages for long times, which is why if you've ever driven a golf cart that's powered by a bunch of car batteries, um, they basically, when they're freshly charged, they're real quick for about 10 minutes. 
and then they slow down pretty quickly after that. And then they go to a nice even state for a long time. And then they'll start to drop off as, it, as you get close to the end of the battery discharge cycle. Um, but that they're not optimized to be the same voltage for a long period of time. Um, alkaline batteries were basically the next one, the next type of battery that was um, invented after lead acid batteries. Which are, and these are like your double A, triple A's. Any any of the the um, batteries with this shape that have like a little button at the top and a flat spot on the bottom, those are your anode and your cathode. Um, and they're all engineered and designed to have this basically concentric cylinders where you get all of one of your um, materials, your cathode material is on the outside, on the inside you get um, your anode material. Um, and then this barrier in between them is your salt bridge. So it's basically just a more creative way to put it into a shape that's easy to use in a lot of places. The only difference between a, a D cell battery and, and a AAA is just the size and therefore the total amount of energy there, but they all have the same voltage. So in theory, you could replace D batteries with with A batteries, they're just not going to last very long because the D batteries are bigger just because they have more of the reactants. So they're like, they have more power density. Did I see a hint? Yeah. Um, rechargeable batteries, are they just like gaining so, electrical currents or like? So we'll talk about rechargeable batteries. Um, basically, by applying an external voltage, we can get redox reactions to go backwards. So technically all batteries are rechargeable, um, but a lot of times if they're not designed to be rechargeable, then things like the salt bridge will start breaking down after you've used them once or twice. And so if the salt bridge is breaking down and you actually have your anode and your cathode in contact with each other, you just get a short circuit instead of actually being able to use it again. So it's more of a physical limitation than a chemical limitation. Chemically, there's no reason why you can't recharge everything infinitely. You know, use a battery, recharge it by hooking up to an external voltage, use it again. It's just that the physical components start breaking down when it's not designed for it. So, like, I have these rechargeable batteries, and I'll put them in my beacon, mm -hmm. and I'll fully charge them, but my beacon tells me that they're at, like, 50%. Is that because, like, the components in them are just, like, they're like brand new, too, from Amazon? So, let me, let me touch, so, so... The where is I have a little note like, about that. They're just like not strong enough as like regular. You're like, reading right into my, my best friend's research in grad school was on lithium ion batteries and why they degrade over time. Um, and so basically the amount of energy in a battery over versus the number of discharge cycles. In other words, the number of times it's been run all the way yeah. to zero and then recharged again. Um, for for standard lithium ion batteries, it go it drops like this really quickly. You wind up dropping, and then it'll stay it'll stay relatively constant for a long time, but then then eventually it gets down you know to the point where they're useless. Where if everybody's had that phone in the past or that computer where battery life used to last you three days, and now you're lucky if you get thirty minutes out of it. Um, yeah. That's normal with, with rechargeable batteries. And, and especially with lithium ion batteries, you see that right away the first time you use them, they're great and they last forever. And then they drop off really, really quickly. Um, my friend's research was actually on, there was a process they discovered, um, in, discovered at the University of Colorado that allows you to put down um, basically layers of atoms where they were looking at aluminum oxide which is not a conductor. So it's not great, but it could kind of function as a salt bridge a little bit if you were only a couple of atoms thick. And so they found this process that allowed them to really, really reliably and uniformly deposit like three atoms thick layer on top of these, the, I think it was the cathode um, lithium iron battery, which drops the first, your initial energy density, but then it stays almost constant. Um, and so there's actually a lot of research going into improving batteries, 
but that also means the the advantage of having lots of research happening at, at once means that there's lots of technologies currently out there and so it's really hard for me to generalize about your batteries because i don't know what's inside your batteries because i'm not looking at them and it's you know there's so much that's happened. this was 10 years ago they were doing this so it's probably entered the market somewhere but i don't know why um and so it might just be that you know your your device is expecting it to be one voltage and it's not because it's a different type of battery or it's a treated battery where it's got some other rechargeable technology and so it thinks it's at half charge when it's at full charge just because it's not they're not designed it's not calibrated to work with that battery specifically um but thanks for the for teeing up the question so i get to talk about this because this was a really fun i saw this figure so many times in grad school with every single week uh, every single time somebody presented on anodes and cathodes and batteries, this or or ALB, the process that they use to deposit the atoms, they always showed this as here's why it's interesting. It was always the same figure. Um, lithium ion batteries work a little bit differently in that the the lithium atoms move. Um, and are part of the, so the atoms that are part of the redox reaction actually wind up migrating through the, the um, salt bridge. No, rather than the traditional battery types, the atoms that were being oxidized and reduced stayed in place. And then you had the tiny atoms moving back and forth between them through the salt bridge. The lithium ion batteries, the lithium ions themselves migrate from the anode to the cathode from the cathode to the anode um, when you discharge them. And that makes it so that because it's pretty easy to recharge because they're such small atoms, they recharge so quickly. Um, the problem with this is that, must have been this material, the, uh, the cathode that actually winds up being um degraded the, the material that they use the liquid that they use in between these it's pretty effective for the for causing this reaction to happen um it also winds up breaking down this material and just just straight up wrecking it it turns into like a sponge um where it just breaks it all that's all apart and so you, that's why you lose that energy density after you do discharge it a few times and so what the the process does that my friend was looking at is that basically adds a barrier that's big enough for the lithium ions to pass through, but small enough that the, um, I think it's phosphorus hexa, phosphorus pentafluoride is the electrolyte that they keep in between the two materials. And it just, just destroyed this stuff. Um, but the aluminum oxide allowed it to basically protect that a little bit. Um, and you, Anyway, um, the other type of battery that's worth talking about, just because it's kind of cool, this, um, is any of this likely to show up on a test? Maybe in general terms, maybe in the definition section, I might ask you what a battery is or something like that. Uh, but in general, this is more just like cool applications rather than something I'd actually test you on. Um, fuel cells are another type of battery. Fuel cells really are just batteries. The difference is that a fuel cell is a battery where you have where you can constantly put be putting in more fuel. So basically, if you think of the voltaic cells we built, um, so the zinc the zinc electrode was being broken down when you had it hooked up in those those voltaic cells, right? Being turned into zinc atoms or zinc ions rather. Um, if you could picture just adding more zinc to the electrode as it was reacting. That's effectively what a fuel cell is. And so fuel cells are usually designed around having a, either a gas or a liquid as your reactant so that you can just add more to it. So basically you're just constantly dumping in your reactant, which allows you to keep Q at a constant ratio and also um, allows you to do things like have a liquid-based fuel source so that you could just pull up to a, a refueling station, use a pump, fill up a tank and then have more energy to power your electric car. So fuel cells are really, really attractive from a, a economic and an engineering point of view because our infrastructure is already set up around 
delivering liquid fuels for, for vehicles, right? Everybody already knows how to pump gas into a car. So something as simple as, well, instead of pumping gas, I'm pumping this liquid full of reactant. It's just not gas anymore. And it allows you to have a, um, an electric car with still has that liquid fuel. The downside of that is those liquid fuels are really, really nasty, typically really, really acidic or really, really basic and full of lots of um, heavy metals as well. And so it never really took off that research in batteries has basically um, gotten so good that that the plug in tr to charge your electric car makes more sense than a fuel cell based car at this point. Um, although it's like we were talking about before where fuel cells might wind up being more useful for um, like delivery trucks for semi trucks might wind up being powered by fuel cells the way they're powered by diesel now. We already have two systems, right? We have diesel versus petroleum. If you know the residential cars were plug into the wall, but your semi your semi trucks were fuel cells, we'd be able to handle that. That's not that hard. To know whether or not you plug your car in, or if you go to this the pump, right? Um, but there's still not there's still a lot of practical limitations to fuel cells. Um, but they really are just batteries. It's just a really interesting way of delivering the reactants and removing um, products that makes it a fuel cell. Technically it's a fuel cell because it's a voltaic cell that allows you to add fuel. Which is not a product well, it depends on your half reactions. You could do this. You have to pick your half. If you, if you did this reaction where bromine was your reactant, um, then bromide would be your, your product, right? In which case bromides aren't that dangerous, aren't really hazardous or anything, but you still would have to transport bromine, liquid bromine to your station, your fueling stations. And that's still kind of nasty. We all smelled the bromine yesterday and that was like a 5% solution. Um, you can imagine liquid bromine is considerably nastier. It could, you know, so there's, there's always a balancing act between how do we make it so that the average person's not going to hurt themselves when they use it, and but also have enough energy density that it can get you from point A to point B. Um, is and that's more of a nature of humanity question than it is an engineering question. But there's actually engineers that specifically study um, how we make something so that people can't hurt themselves with it. Um, in uh, in the software industry, that's the the QA, the people that go in, the beta testers that go in and try to break stuff, they actually have engineers whose job is to try and find ways to make things fail so that people know what, what the dangers are, so that the companies know what the dangers are to try to fix them. Um, and fuel cells have a lot of points of failure and tend to be rather dangerous when they do fail. Um, but yes. like hydrogen gas, Hydrogen gas is not particularly safe. And you get to talk to the people on the Hindenburg about that. Um, although, has anybody ever looked up the Hindenburg, the Wikipedia page on the Hindenburg? Everybody's heard of it. It's so dramatic. You know how many people died? Like 30 people, 40 people, something like that. The tiny number of people died, but it was a giant, massive fireball of a hydrogen filled up when it exploded. But only like, it seems like from all the pictures and stuff, it's definitely double digits. It definitely didn't hit 100. I don't want to say it's between 30 and 50 people. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Hydrogen gas can be dangerous. Um, and it's really hard to store safely. Uh, here's, do you guys know that a breathalyzer is a fuel cell? Um, breathalyzer is a fuel cell that takes ethanol and allows it to react and in doing so generates current. By measuring the amount of current that comes out, you can actually figure out how much ethanol went in. We can, we can power. We can, you can, in theory, power your car. But... There is no ethanol. <laughs> there is no ethanol. There would be no current. If there's no there's ethanol, there's no current. Car. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's 35. 35. Right. Current. I you got to reach it. Yeah, 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 it's giant. Oh, like, it's, it's like 100 yards tall. Yeah. 
Right, so it's, well, it's, well, it's not nearly as dramatic as that's like a plane crash. A plane crash is way worse than the Hindenburg was, but the Hindenburg exploded in a giant ball of fire and was had a lot of people watching it at the time. So well, that's why it lives on in, in uh, cultural memory. Um, all right. Um, all this to say, there's lots of ways to use voltaic cells in lots of different applications for them. And it's unlikely there's one way to use it that's going to wind up actually being the dominant battery. There's going to be the dominant battery for cars versus the dominant battery for solar cell storage versus all these other types versus fuel cells for some applications, et cetera. <clears throat> all right, so this is actually what we're going to be doing. I think we ended on this slide last time. I reordered these a little bit. Um, this is what we're going to be doing next week in lab. So Monday and Tuesday of next week, we're going to be doing an electrolysis lab where we're not going to be reducing chlorine and sodium um, because that would be dangerous and irresponsible. We're going to be generating hydrogen gas instead because that's much safer. Um, it actually is compared to chlorine. Chlorine gas is really nasty stuff. Uh, it's almost as dangerous as, as hydrogen gas in terms of being both explosive, but it's also poisonous. Hydrogen gas is, at least isn't poisonous too. Um, but basically, instead of making a voltaic cell and measuring the voltage, we're going to supply the voltage and, and power to half reactions and cause them to go backwards. So we'll generate hydrogen gas and we'll wind up oxidizing a metal. Normally, those two would go in the opposite direction. If you put the metal ions with hydrogen gas, they could react for the hydrogen to be uh, oxidized and the metal to be reduced. But by uh, supplying the voltage, we can cause it to go backwards. Um, and if you do that with just water, you can wind up generating, you have two inert, um, two inert um, electrodes you can wind up generating oxygen gas and hydrogen gas. And this is, we're going to do the right-hand side, not the left-hand side. We don't have the custom glassware for it. We don't need it though. We're basically just gonna take an upside-down burette. An upside-down burette that actually measures the volume of gas pretty effectively. Um, so, and instead of generating oxygen on the other side, we're gonna have a metal, mystery metal and we'll be able to figure out what that metal is by weighing the electrode before and after. And then say, okay, well, if I made this many milliliters of hydrogen, I can use the ideal gas law to figure out how many moles of hydrogen that is. If you know how many moles of hydrogen you made, then you can figure out how many moles of metal reacted. And if you know how many grams of metal reacted and how many moles of metal reacted, grams divided by moles gives you an atomic mass. So we'll get some practice with this next week and I'll reiterate all that and we'll be able, it'll be in the background information on next week's lab and everything. Um, but just as a, as a heads up, that's where we're going in lab. It's also how electro, electroplating works. You can plate things using the process like we talked about before, um, generating solid copper. But if you, if you apply a voltage, you can get it to work a lot more effectively and evenly. And there's more to it than this because we actually want to make it so that the, the uh, plated atoms stay there, stay in place and can be polished and things like that. So they treat the surface and have other chemicals in the mixture that allow it to actually stay plated and look better. Um, but effectively, that's all you're doing if you're trying to plate something is you're going to take the silver at the anode, it's just a silver ingot, or you can get silver in solution in another way. Um, and you're gonna oxidize the silver ingot on one side and you're gonna reduce the silver on the other side by, apply, by applying voltage. And that causes the silver ions that are in solution to get deposited as silver metal um, based on uh, providing that voltage source. Um, we can do math with this. I, I think we're going to probably, well, I guess we'll do one, one of these problems. Um, 
This is more of a physics problem than it is a chemistry problem, although you have to use chemistry to understand it and to actually do this process. Um, but we can actually calculate how much sulfur gets deposited based on current and time. Um, this equation is, is sometimes just called the electrolysis equation. If you apply outside energy in the form of Q, the total, somebody who's taken physics more recently than me, um, what's current times time? What value do you get for that? Or what unit? Coulombs, right. So coulombs is a unit of charge. And basically the number of electrons times Faraday's constant. Faraday's constant is the charge in coulombs of one mole of electrons. So if you know what the current is and what how much time that current was applied over the amount of time, the time over which that current was applied. Probably a better way of saying that sentence. Um, we can actually figure out how many moles of electrons were added. And if you know how many moles of electrons were added and you know what the half reaction is, you can figure out how many moles of your metal were deposited. So in this case, if we have a current, it's passed in 10.23 amps, and it, was and it was passed through an electrolytic cell for exactly one hour. How many moles of electrons passed through the cell? Well, moles of electrons, that's N. F is constant, it's Faraday's constant. I is current. And lowercase e is time. In seconds. And our current is always in amps. Not really anything too tricky about the math here, right? If you're given current. Um, and we're not going to get creative with asking word problems that ask you to go through a bunch of calculations to get current because this isn't a physics class. So for a question like this, it's going to give you the current pretty, in a pretty obvious way. And then F is a constant and T, there's always gonna be a time involved. And we all know how to recognize time units pretty easily, right? So as long as you remember to put your time into seconds and your current in amps, this, these are pretty easy problems to solve. So in this case, N is equal to 10.23 times 3,600 seconds exactly over, somebody remind me what Faraday's constant is? Nine, nine times 10 to the four, 9.6? And that's in coulombs per mole. Coulomb is just a capital C, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. So a little under a mole. And is a little bit less than one, right? No, sorry, about point five. That's the trick is that that's moles of electrons. And so depending on what metal we're depositing, if it's a metal that requires, if our half reaction requires two moles of electrons. So for instance, we're, if we were starting from copper two plus, and we were depositing copper, we're gonna copper plate something. Usually we don't bother with that because copper is, it's not cheap, but it's not expensive enough to be worth plating something in copper. But if we wanted to do that, we would need two electrons for every one mole of copper two ions, right? 
So basically, whatever your balanced half reaction is, is going to give you the give you a conversion. This is moles of electron. If it's silver, silver is only ever present at the plus one when it's the ion okay. So silver plus plus one electron makes silver metal. In which case, that makes this step really easy, right? We know it's one to one. We can just say, okay, well, for every one mole of electrons, that's one mole of silver positive. And if we want a mass, like for question two, then we just use the atomic mass. Atomic mass of silver is 107, I think. Ballpark, at least, this means that we're going to be able to apply about 40 grams. We actually did this process. We could deposit about 40 grams of silver using this process over the course of an hour. Um, in general, with most, most chemical processes, the slower you go, the more uniform it's going to be and the nicer it's going to look. You try to make nice crystals. They're going to, the best crystals are formed by going really, really slowly uh, going through the crystal formation process. And the same for electroplating. The slower you go on electroplating, the, net, the smoother the surface is going to be, the better adhered those particles are going to be. In general, when you try to rush something in chemistry, that's when it gets ruined. Um, can't tell you the number of times I've done tried to do, you know, do a lab or um, something, and at the last step I rushed it because I was running out of time or I had some place to be, and that's always where it gets ruined. It's when the second you try to rush something. And so this reaction or this equation, you have to know what the variables are, but as long as we know what the variables are. Piece of cake. You've got to be given a current. You've got to be given a time. You've got to be given two out of those three variables, and then you have a constant. All right. Any questions on this? Last, um, last couple slides. Just as another topic to in some vocab um, to apply this. And then we'll take a break and come back and talk about a different chapter. Um, corrosion of metal in the real world is redox reaction too, which makes sense. We call it oxidation. We need something to do oxidation. Uh, we're trying to sound fancy um, or be accurate. But that also means it also has a physical component to it as well. The reason that water causes things to rust is because basically it allows you to create a voltaic cell. Technically, anytime you have two metals adjacent to each other and any amount of, of water around, you're going to create a voltaic cell. And that's going to cause one of those metals to oxidize and the other one to be reduced. Because every metal has a different oxidation potential than every other metal, right? So anytime you have a mixed metal junction where there's any sort of humidity, it's going to cause corrosion over time. If you've ever seen a, um, a copper pipe that was, um, that was all rusted at a joint, usually that's because the solder that you use is basically um, sweating copper and, and sealing copper pipes is effectively just soldering. Um, and so, but you use it metal a different metal than the copper and so over time you wind up with that metal degrading because um, you wind up forming these voltaic cells at a very small scale in the case of just like a single water droplet you have iron with water on it and exposed to oxygen you can wind up with these two reactions happening o2 plus plus an acid plus four electrons turns into water and iron turns into iron two. Or if it's not acidic, 
you can still have this process happen. You just wind up making a basic solution as your product. But either way, just having water present in the presence of um, oxygen gas means we wind up with these two half reactions happening, causing rust. So it actually is the water that does it. It's not the, the water is actually not participating in the reaction in, in this first case. But if you don't have water, then you don't have you don't have hydronium. You don't have H pluses floating around. You don't have H pluses floating around. This process can't happen. Um, basically, if you want to totally prevent corrosion, you basically need to prevent it from being exposed to oxygen. Any any metal, but especially iron and aluminum, if they're exposed to oxygen, will oxidize eventually, even if it's not right away. Minimizing exposure to humidity will slow the process down. But if you want to actually stop the process, it needs to be in an anoxic environment, um, which is why metals, even really crappy metals like like bronze or or iron, wind up getting preserved at the bottom of peat bogs. Everybody know what peat bog is? Everybody heard that term? It's basically it's a it's a marsh that has this is I think it's an algae. Is peat an algae? Well, yeah, there's algae, but there's like, I think it comes from the bacteria breaking them down, like creating little mini beds. Yeah, basically you wind up with the mud at the bottom of these bogs. It's totally anoxic, no oxygen present, and so when you bury something in that, it lack even if it's metal that normally would rust really quickly. Um, the fact that it's sealed off in an anoxic environment for hundreds of thousands of years um, means that they tend to be in still in pretty good condition when they find these artifacts. You see a lot of it in Northern Europe. Um, peat bogs are really, really common in Northern Europe where there's lots of moisture, lots of water, uh, but also colder temperatures. Was that? Lots of scotch. Lots of scotch, yeah. It does make, so actually, if you there's actually a pretty good historical fiction book about what led to the time of troubles in Northern Ireland um, called Trinity um, by the same guy. Actually, if you, any of you have seen that new series on FX Shogun, um, I believe it's the no, that's James Clavell. Never mind. You, Leon Uris is the author of this book called Trinity. Um, in Ireland, actually, one of the few natural products that they had in Ireland that they were basically forced to mine and give to the English during during the English occupation was peat. Old peat bogs left behind basically it's it was effectively like less fossilized coal. It's something you could burn like a charcoal um, to stay warm or um, you could use it as a filter if you wanted to filter out impurities from your scotch. So that's why some scotches, some whiskeys have are, fil are filtered through peat. Peat is actually just this what's left over when a peat bog drains. Um, and it's just, it didn't burn. So actually lots of people used it as a heat source in Ireland and in, in Scotland in the, like in the pre-industrial revolution days. Um, but anyway, that's also why they find lots of uh, historical artifacts and things like that in peat bogs is because they've been sequestered away, away from oxygen for thousands of years. Um, other than that, the only things that are still gonna be left after thousands of years of being buried in dirt are gonna be gold because it doesn't oxidize really. If you wanna prevent corrosion, you, you really don't prevent corrosion so much as you undo corrosion. Um, or you have what's called a sacrificial metal, which a lot of times is zinc, mixed in with your iron. If you have something that, that oxidizes even easier than iron, like zinc, the zinc winds up being oxidized and that allows the iron to stay in its metallic state and stay reduced. Um, and so that's actually what stainless steel is. It's got a mixture of other metals mixed into iron. Um, in a way that allows for this sort of controlled corrosion in a way that doesn't affect conductivity, doesn't affect, doesn't build up visible um, spots of, of uh, discoloration or corrosion. Um, so stainless steel and steel in general is lasts longer than iron because it has these sacrificial metals built into it. And usually a lot of times also is 
is the sacrificial metals wind up forming a layer that also helps protect the iron underneath it um, by, by making a barrier that oxygen can't pass through as well. Um, aluminum does that too. Aluminum oxidizes really, really fast, but we're used to thinking of ox uh, aluminum as being pretty like rust resistant, right? Um, it turns out it actually oxidizes almost immediately when it's exposed to oxygen, but it makes an, an airtight barrier over it that's only a few atoms thick. So you wind up sealing off the aluminum metal from oxygen by making aluminum oxide in between, um, which is why we don't use aluminum as for wiring anymore. Old knob and tube wiring sometimes had aluminum wiring in it, but it's actually not, a, it's a really good conductor and it doesn't corrode visibly, but the surface corrodes at the, at the molecular level. And that means that you can't actually, it's not actually a good conductor um, pack if you're trying to pass electrons through aluminum from one material to another, it doesn't work very well because of that buildup of aluminum oxide on the outside. Like a galvanized metal. Galvanized, that's actually, sorry, that's actually what this is, uh, is, is that's the process of galvanizing something. A gal is creating a galvanic cell um, by mixing in a sacrificial metal with the metal that actually is pro providing the structural support. So galvanized tin is tin mixed with zinc, and the zinc oxidizes and the tin doesn't. Um, and same with, with a lot of the stainless um, metals. All right. Next slide is talking about why do reactions progress? We're changing topics here. Um, I just think the electrochemistry applications are really, really interesting. So normally this is stuff we'd skip and we would be a half a lecture ahead, but I think it's fun to talk about. And I haven't taught this class in a while. So y'all get to hear it too. Um, let's take a break. Let's come back at uh, seven after, or best, close to, and we'll start talking about rates and chemical reactions. Yeah, you don't want to do that. The other thing, too, is make sure you think about it. Oh, yeah, I definitely. I almost destroyed my view. Yeah, like the little I got some, like, I left my charge for like, it almost like didn't work. That's so scary. I know. I work when the summer comes, I. Are you that is very Oh yeah, which one do you have? Yeah, that's You would think like uh, some like there's some like nicer ones, but they actually didn't like those as much as they um, they like they, they like make more calculations. There's two like it's like not it's like because they get out of it. Like so fine. Other people will it's like at a larger distance, so like each kind of actually is like right now. So it's like that, like the number for like the population. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 15 minutes late. I actually like 1545 minutes yeah. early out. <laughs> right. It's empty today. Yeah. <laughs> Spring, no, we can do it. You're gonna, I've, I've eaten one muffin today. Oh, uh, I saw those, yeah. What? Have any muffin today? So, I love it. Had that for breakfast, and then um, uh, then I came to fucking lab and it wasn't actually lab. It was I see it. Oh, you came in it. Yeah. Oh no, I didn't. Not so sure actually first. Oh, then I should have played. I pulled up, grabbed the paper. <laughs> it was me. 
Is that what it was today? Just I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was there for just a minute. I just grabbed yeah, it. Yeah, I, I walked in and watched it. <laughs> yeah. I just don't want to come. Yeah, you don't have to. I thought it was good. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I, didn't feel like I mean, eventually we're going to be doing. Well, uh, yeah. 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 What else do you guys get on it? It's based on a similar route? Or... Yeah, I, went, I tried it a route to the side. He did a couple of routes off to the side. Yeah, I just did that one. I, it's so, it's so fun. Yeah, it's like, it's a cheaper skin that I used to do. Like, I thought it was so great. Um, Ooh, but it's fun. I did like outdoor climbing. Yeah. <laughs> It's different type of rock too. You know, to like, it's just crazy to like. If you go to Nike, you put like a super skin friend, you can climb all day. Yeah. 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 I don't think it's like, yeah, it's skin friendly, but it's just like crazy to like. Like, I think that area is like yeah. hard to see about it. Your foot like, your feet. Yeah. Where you like, need to be putting your feet and like. And have a feet break on you. I think it's crazy to being like, okay, I'm going to put my foot here. Like, I, I don't think that. I don't think yeah. like, It's definitely just different when, I don't know, people are been climbing for a lot longer. Like, you can like look at something and be like, yeah. Oh, um, no. I mean, even still, if you've been kind of like, yeah. yeah. so like I thought I read a question for you when you brought up aluminum. Uh, aluminum albums, since they're redox, they're actually right? Mm -hmm. How does that work? I'm sure that I can, like, how does it work? With Mercury. Like, so, I was watching the video the other day. Oh, okay. So it was originally. Oh, oh, so kind of like, oh, I don't know. Like, like, blue and purple. Yeah. So, they're from a long time. So the mercury, like never look at the, the half reaction, but mercury is usually more stable than that. Yeah. Yeah. But mercury is yeah. still oxidized with oxygen. Rigid, so, so a lot of times that's why if you have mercury you exposed to oxygen, it actually creates like, like a film of the mercury on the side of the side. If you put your coin back in, then they're like, then it'll actually want to break it up a little bit. And then it breaks down. So it's not like breaks up, it breaks down that oxidation barrier, and it also allows all of the drip through the oxide to be reduced back to the mercury metal, right? And the aluminum. All into a little bit of that quickly. So that's why you can, that's all you get to go Exactly, because it's the aluminum oxide is not as dense as aluminum metal. 
No, like it's like expanding. Okay, then it takes that out. Definitely. Uh, it's, 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 it's like, a combination of a few things like happening. Like but the ones that they're not going to be done. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then they which is good. Well, my only block for you is on the No, it's a really charge. More around the shoes and Yeah, it'll be. You wind up with it. I never end up producing other negatively charged things like all of my shoes are around the shoes. And they are still. You probably wind up producing something, producing some hydrogen gas. I don't think so. The hydrogen you have a little moisture. Yes, I mean, yeah. Or they have to come off for like right. maybe like yeah it doesn't time. really you can't but it's it's kind of an animal game negative like so much get to that point you try to keep producing it it'll just produce something else it's not just you try the other thing at the gym was really good i was trying to get a girl i was trying to get her to get more beginner level shoes but then she put those on and she was like oh she's like so much better and like uh, so i was like climb like, around the wall you know me she's like she just felt like she got way more traction with them so she didn't find those uh, and i ran into her and i was like, hey, like oh they're great <laughs> that was... also that was within a week of her climbing and it's going to take a couple of weeks I like them all. Like, well, dude, I would recommend like, those like, that like yeah. are really good. Yeah, yeah. that's not I don't think I'm ready to plug in. Yeah, I have It's good to be a lot of cooler. Yeah. No, I think the only thing that's like, I just put a tighter on my heels. So, I get all and they kind of are good like all around or like on the shoe. I like the heel on them a lot too. And then for outside of like the uh I've been using the great solution. I think those are really great. I don't think a lot of people have been using the heel on those if they've been really well. Well, once you do it's too like that's like the one of them. Basically, I've been been talking to people about it. Once you learn how to use the heel, that's like the big one of love. And then when you learn how to use your toe, that's like having like having a third arm. Yeah, it's like having a third. What are we gonna do with the fill here? Yeah, it's my it's my own size. It's not really great. It's still flat. I would recommend the British shoe because they're pretty thin. Honestly, I don't like the They're really high performance. But like they don't last too long, especially if your footwork's not like pristine. Yeah. Things that I want Yeah. You never heard the word pristine? Well, not the footwork. That's weird. Yeah. Pristine. So pristine. Do you ever? Yeah. This is pristine. Got a big thing on my hand. Yeah, sure, bro. Big shoes. All right, let's <laughs> let's bring it back. <laughs> Draga, the, the brand name is the shoe. Tanaya makes you know what that's named after. Tanaya instead of and Yosemite. So Tanaya Peak is named after Chief Tanaya, which who was one of the last leaders of uh, the Native Americans like who lived in Yosemite. Yeah. In Yosemite. There's also a Tanaya Canyon. It's like a death trap of a of a uh, climb. That area in, is so beautiful. It is. It's uh Yosemite's a really fun place. I I grew up going every Mother's Day. Big yeah. group of my my parents' friends would at all camp in the campsites there. Awesome. So I grew up going to all the. We went in the like hey, don't go in this area. It's dangerous areas all the time. Tanaya Canyon was one of those. It was a lot of fun. Um. All right, especially as I had no idea how dangerous it actually was at the time. <laughs> One of those cases. Um, all right, so let's talk about how reactions happen a little bit more. We've talked about a little bit about whether reactions will occur, right? That's that delta G and cell potential to some extent will allow us to predict whether a reaction is spontaneous or not, but it doesn't really tell us anything about how it happens. Um, and so the, I mean, what's our definition of, of a spontaneous process? Does anybody, I, how do we know if a reaction is spontaneous? Standard conditions yeah. automatically. 
at standard conditions delta G, and really a reaction will happen as long as delta G is negative. As long as delta G is negative, then that means that the entropy of the universe is increasing. All this comes back to the set, what's called the second law of thermodynamics, which is any process that happens spontaneously happens because it's increasing the entropy of the universe. Um, and so if you go back to your original definition of delta G, when you first learned about or did that chapter on thermodynamics, um, there was a derivation in there that looked at um, entropy of the universe. And the second law just says that anything that happens spontaneously happens because entropy of the universe increases. Things it's hard to measure the entropy of the universe, right? Entropy of the universe is kind of the universe is kind of big. How do we know what's happening? Well, all we can really talk about is our system, right? And so what, what happens is you wind up breaking up the universe, the entire universe, into it's either our system or it's the surroundings. Surroundings literally encapsulates the rest of the universe besides our chemicals that we're interested in this particular reaction. And so we can say, okay, well, if delta S for the system plus delta S of the surroundings. So then we just need a way to quantify how much the entropy of the system is changing. Well, we have that. That's our delta S of formation values that we can look up at the back of the book, right? We actually have a way of measuring delta S for our system um, by using those tables. How do we quantify delta S of the surroundings? Well, we basically said, well, let's assume that our chemical reaction might happen and everything else in the entire rest of the universe is going to remain the same. No other chemical reactions are happening at the same time. That's not obviously not actually true, right? But for the purposes of just breaking up the entire universe into our system and everything else, we're just going to look treat the rest of the universe like it's relatively static. Um, and so one of the ways we can say this is, or we can do with that is we can say, okay, well, delta S of the surroundings, if no other chemical reactions are happening, the only thing that's happening in the surroundings is, is what our system dumps into it. And so we basically quantify delta S of the surroundings as um, the Q for the system divided by the temperature. Q in terms of, that's Q, that's heat. Basically, how much heat does our reaction give away to the surroundings divided by the temperature is actually uh, energy units per Kelvin is actually a, a unit of entropy, a unit of disorder. Well, the other way of saying this, if we make some, if we define some terms and do some, some math and some substitution, um, That allows us to say, okay, well, that really means that delta S for the entire rest of the universe is just the change in enthalpy for our system. Because the only thing, the only way our system is interacting with the rest of the universe is by giving it energy in the form of heat. Is that actually true? Depending on how you define things, yeah. Basically, if we say our system is isolated and only interacts with the rest of the universe in terms of passing temperature along, then that actually is, it holds up. If we plug this in there, then what we get is, is something that defines delta S of the universe in terms of that are only based on Um, the system. So in other words, only looking at things that our system can um, can contribute to. This is starting to look like it like some familiar variables. Right? This is where that delta G equation came from. The reason that delta G, we use delta G as a way of estimating whether a reaction is spontaneous or not, is because delta G really is just a way of looking at delta S for the entire universe. Right. Basically, if you just multiply everything by negative temperature, we get negative temperature times delta S of the universe equals delta H. 
for the system minus T times delta S for the system. So in other words, delta S of the universe is Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is just a, a convenient way of describing the entropy for the entire universe of a, of a particular reaction. So why is this relevant? Well, when I say things like this, reactions naturally progress to more stable states. What I mean by that is spontaneous reactions happen because the entropy of the universe is increasing. Things that are downhill in energy for the system mean the entropy of the universe increased. So this explains kind of how we can predict if it's spontaneous or not. It doesn't say anything about how we get from A to B though, or from reactants to products. Um, there's a lot of things that, a lot of uh, ways we can classify reactions um, as a way to say, okay, well, here's an example of a common reaction that's usually spontaneous under normal conditions. Um, for instance, if we're in chemistry, usually we're talking about electron-rich molecules being attracted to electron-poor molecules. That, was a, that is a reaction that in general tends to increase the entropy of the universe. Um, so a lot of times, molecules that have a lot, a lot of electrons are attracted to molecules with not very many electrons. In doing so, that goes from a high energy state to a low energy state. This still doesn't really say anything about why though, right? It just allows us to predict this is a tricky one though, because basically you can't, it's one of those, well, because it seems like that's the way the universe works answers. We've gotten, we've asked why enough times that now we've reached that, well, that's how the universe works. What do you mean? Why did the entropy of the universe increase? It just does. It is the entropy of the universe. Therefore it must be increasing. Um, and I'm sure that mathematicians and theoretical physicists have some way of describing this or have a theory um, um, that explains why the second law of thermodynamics is the way it is. That's beyond the scope of this class, though. So for this class, all we know is that, generally speaking, we go from high energy to low energy. High energy states are less common because things naturally progress towards more stable states. In doing so, that increases the entropy of the universe. Um, if we want to talk about the process, though, of going from A plus B to C plus D, then something else has to happen, though, because even spontaneous processes, processes that are downhill in energy, don't necessarily happen in the real world. So spontaneous we have to be careful with that term in chemistry because spontaneous in chemistry means entropy of the universe increases. That doesn't mean that it'll actually happen on a measurable time scale. So where we're going with this is the rate of reaction is the other piece. Thermodynamics going from less stable to more stable, that's the first step, equilibrium. But how you get from A to B or from A plus B to C plus D and the time it takes to do so turns out to actually be a non-trivial issue. Turns out that's actually kind of an interesting, tricky problem as well. Because if you look at something like carbon as, as a diamond, um, going through a spontaneous phase change to be carbon as graphite, this is actually spontaneous at at uh, standard conditions, at sea level pressure, standard temperatures, this process has a negative delta G. How come we don't observe it happening then? Doesn't take right. so long. Because it takes so long. Basically, the rate is such that the, the energy barrier between point A and point B is so high that if you took a diamond and, and you couldn't actually have a diamond at the time of the Big Bang, 
but let's say that using that as a as a just a this is the beginning of time. You literally took a diamond at the beginning of time and observed it from then until now. It still would not have a measurable amount of graphite formed. It is. It's weird, especially considering that we call that process spontaneous using our scientific definition of the word spontaneous. So all of that just to say spontaneous doesn't mean it happens. And this is why like the term spontaneous combustion, if you talk to people that are that are trying to talk to you about spontaneous combustion, they'll start talking about think about all the energy that's present in the molecules of your body. What's to stop it from spontaneously combusting? Well, because it can spontaneously combust, even though it's downhill in energy to do so, nobody's going to spontaneously combust because the rate issue, because there's this barrier, this boundary, where you're not going to see have any measurable amount of reactants make it to product. If, um, if I had a super ball, just a bouncy ball, and I threw it as hard as I could at lake level, is there any possible chance I could actually give it enough energy to bounce it out of the basin? Always. <laughs> I mean, it's funny to think about, but no, right? Like there is no way I can give it enough energy to make it over that barrier. Whether that barrier is Spooner or Mount Rose or Echo, I don't care. I can't throw it over any of them, right? Could, is there a process that could cause that to happen? Maybe we could probably design something that could do that. Um, we'd have to change the system though, in order to make that happen. And so that's what happens in between reactants and products. That's where rates comes into effect. So a couple of definition things. How do we define the rate of a chemical reaction? Well, rate is always, we're always going to talk about rates in terms of change in an amount per change in time. So, so far, we've talked a lot about change in here, right? Our ice tables and our stoichiometry is all about change before and after, but we didn't talk about with respect to time. That's what we've left off so far. Um, and the tricky thing about this is that this is, how many of you have had calculus? Calc one at least, right? You can see kind of where we're going with this. This is almost like the definition of a derivative. Um, but calculus is not a prereq for this class. So we can't talk, we can talk about it kind of in calculus terms, but we're not going to use calculus in this class. Yet, yeah. take more chemistry, take PCHEM, and you'll get all into all the calculus and get to do all the fun stuff. Um, but that's a third year class. Um, when we talk about the rate of a reaction, specifically, it's always going to be final minus initial for time change as well, divided by the change in time. For this generic reaction that we have written, is there any other way we could write the rate that would be equal? Do we have to measure change in C? What else could we look at? Yeah. Change in concentration of D with respect to time would give us the same number, right? So we don't, the fact that we stoichiometry exists and the fact that we balance for balanced reaction, we know the relative ratios, how they're all changing together, means that we can actually define a rate based on any of these, right? Which is helpful because we don't always have a way of measuring concentration of C and D, but as long as we can measure concentration of A, then that allows us to get the rate, the rate for the entire reaction. If the rate is the rate of the product formation, how can we measure how would we represent the rate in terms of A? Yeah, we just say that the rate is equal to the negative change in the concentration of A or B. And what about if there's coefficients? Well, 
we did that with our ice tables, right? That just meant we threw a number in front of it. If A is changing at a different rate than C, we just take that into account. also equal to negative change in concentration of B, right? The thing about the rate is the rate is always going to be relative to the reaction itself. So if we had A was being used up at a different rate, it was being used up twice as fast as B, we'd still have to have a way to normalize that. So here's an example. For this reaction, iodine plus hydrogen, you make hydroionic acid. And that rate of that reaction, we could write it as rate equal to negative change in hydrogen gas divided by by change in time, right? What if we wanted to define it in terms of HI? Well, the rate of the, of the reaction is going to be equal to change in concentration of HI over change in time, are we going to multiply by two or divide by two though? By two to get one. Divide by two because we're making it twice as fast. Reaction happens once, we get two molecules of HI, right? So if the, re if the rate of the reaction is slower than the rate of I, of HI formation, we're going to say it's one over two times your concentration of HI, your change in HI concentration over change in time. So basically, whatever your coefficients are, you're just going to normalize the rate by saying, okay, if I'm looking at the rate with respect to this compound, you're always going to divide by its coefficient. As long as its coefficient is one, you're dividing by one and no change. But if you have a different coefficient, you have to divide by that coefficient. Would it be positive or negative if we're talking about HI? Positive, because we're always talking about formation of products. So if we're making HI, then that's going to be a positive rate. If in, if our concentration of HI goes up, which it should if the reaction is happening from left to right, then we should see a positive rate value. Um, we can do this experimentally. Like I said, we're not going to do calculus for this class. So usually the way we're going to measure rates is literally by looking at the concentration at time A and looking at the concentration at time B and, this, and look at doing final minus initial. So for this reaction, just A goes to B. We start with a jar that's just A, one mole of A at time zero. At 20 seconds, we have 0.54 moles of A and 0.46 moles of B. What's the rate of the reaction in terms of, of either of them, really? If we know these numbers, what's the easiest way to do our change? You look, look at, yeah, and, and we generally, if we can, it's easier to do this by measuring concentration of the product, because then we don't have that weird negative sign thrown in there, right? So our change in B over change in time, Delta always is final minus initial, right? So final at it's we say final, but really we mean at time A. I should stop saying A. At this time, 20 seconds. So it's gonna be 0.46 moles minus concentration originally, which was zero. Over final time is 20 seconds. Minus the initial time, which is zero seconds. So rate equals 0 0.023. 0 0.023. What are our units on it? 
per second? Close. Um, we are also, so technically these should be all concentrations. The way it's written, you're absolutely right. Yeah. In theory, they should be in, in molarity units. So it should be moles per liter per second to normalize for the fact that not all of the, you know, a different jar would have a different volume, but the rate of the reaction should be the same. What about from, what's the, the average rate from time equals zero to time equals 40 seconds? Ending with 70.7 moles per liter of E. So point. And over 40 seconds. What'd you say this? Point zero. Moles per liter per second. In this case, moles per second, since we're assuming a constant volume for this whole thing. How come they're not the same? Because the rates change. And why do rates change? <laughs> that's a good that's a good non-answer. Things slow down, things, things slow down, things speed up. Well, what are some variables that affect rates? Mm -hmm. yeah. The amount, why? When you get less, you can you start to make less. Yeah, well, when you have less reactants, you have less chance. You have less chance. So what you just hit on was called uh, collision theory. I believe is the term there. Um, basically, in order for things to happen, things need to run into other things. If you want. If we have A plus B goes to C, well, you need A to run into B for that to happen. Physically, they need to be, if they're going to run into each other and combine to make something new, they physically have to hit each other, right? And it's collision theory. Literally, they need to collide for this to happen. So if things need to collide, then how much A and how much B we have are going to affect this, right? If we have no A, it doesn't matter how much B we have, this reaction can't happen, right? There's a zero probability chance that A runs into B if there is no A. Takes two to tango. I like that. <laughs> like you just came up with that right now. <laughs> what else could change how likely this is to happen? The volume meeting. And so that's why it's not really just how many moles of A and moles of B, it's also the space they have to move, right? If, if we're doing a chemistry lab in a theoretical chemistry um, space where every single group has an entire room like this, let's say that we're, the entire school was our chemistry lab. How likely are you to run into somebody else while you're walking around? Not very likely, right? We take the same group of students, same 24 students, same number of groups and put you in the portal, you're much more likely to run into each other, right? So the space that you have to move affects things. So it's not just how much you have, it's the concentration of it. And you got one car in the, in the portable. Right, and you only have one one car in the port. We're mixing and matching our analogies here, but that's okay. We need, and it, it's going to depend on the concentration of both of these, right? You need A and B, and both of them in the same space for this to work. All right, so go back to our students in the in the lab analogy. If everybody is going nice and slow and taking their time and stopping and looking both ways before they walk around a corner every single time. It's going to take you forever to finish your lab, but how many collisions are there going to be? Very little, right? 
if everybody's rushing, if I give you one hour to do a three hour lab and tell you you're going to be graded on whether or not you finish, you're going to be hustling, right? What do you think is going to happen to the amount of collisions that are going to occur? It's going to go up, right? So the speed is not just how much A and how much B you have, but also the speed that A and B are moving at. How do we represent that chemically? What is our way of representing the speed of molecules? Heat, temperature. So temperature is also going to affect rates. If we have different temperatures, that's going to affect how quickly things happen. Um, and so all of these factors go into, um, so the, the first one we looked at when we looked at molarity. So let's, here's our hypothetical reaction again. If we look at the initial rate, meaning, you know, we looked at it in the first 10 seconds of a reaction. And if all we did was say, okay, we increased the amount of A we have, and then measure the rate over the first 10 seconds. So we're keeping the, the time frame that we're looking at the same for each of these dots, for each of these, these um, pieces of data. Then when you change your concentration of A, you change your rate. The rate goes up the more A you have, and it looks pretty proportional, right? You double your amount of A, then the rate doubles more or less. If I could draw straight lines, that would be more obvious. But it should be pretty much directly proportional. You double your concentration of A, you double your the rate of the reaction. Because you double the chances that A runs into B. Well, the same should be true for B, right? So the rate of a reaction, if it's proportional, what's proportional mean in mathematical terms? One to one, and there's no intercept, right? If we're at zero A, the reaction can't happen, right? So if we're at zero A, then the rate is zero. And it also means mathematically that we can represent our rate as a a constant times our concentration, right? Our concentration doubles, rate doubles. We don't know what this K is. What does it represent on the graph? The slope. The slope of the line, rise over run, is this K term. Well, but if B, also affects the rate here, then our rates, this isn't our complete rate equation, right? Because there's other variables that we didn't take into account. What's the other variable? Time. Well, time is taken into account by the fact that we're looking at a rate already. If we let the time go longer, and we'll talk about this in a second, you're going the right place, but you're ahead of where, where I want to be. B also affects it, right? So for a simple reaction that's just A runs into B and it makes our products, a rate of both of our reactants matters, right? So really it's rate equals a constant times A times B. Right? Because if we held A constant and doubled the concentration of B, we should get the same graph, right? We can change either of these concentrations and change the rate. So this right here, this is called the rate law or an equation. Every reaction is going to have its own rate law and have its own rate constant. And so different reactions are going to have different rate laws because it turns out not every reaction goes through a simple one step, A runs into B. Turns out some reactions are more complicated than that. 
but every reaction is going to have a rate law. It's going to be based on your concentrations of reactants. Right, so the generic form for anything for a rate law, the rate is equal to a constant times the concentration of reactant one and concentration of reactant two, so that there's these exponent terms. If there was three components, if there are three reactants, then we would have a third reactant here with its own exponent. The nice thing about this is that at this stage, X, Y, and Z for each of these is going to be determined experimentally. You're not supposed to be able to predict based on a balanced reaction what the steps are. The actual process that the reaction goes through is called the mechanism. And that's, we spend a whole half of the class in OCHEM on organic mechanisms. What are the actual pathways? What are the intermediates you make in this reaction? At this point though, all we can really do is say, okay, well, I know that this reaction has A, B, and C reacting to make something else, but as far as how important A, B, and C are to your rate, that's something we have to just determine experimentally. We'll test it by doing things like, okay, let's change our concentration of A and see what that does to the rate. And it turns out that your exponents here are, for this class at least, are always gonna be zero, one, or two. If your exponent is zero, on let's say that x, let's say x is zero, what is anything to the zero power? One. Does it matter how big A is in that case? No. No, it doesn't. In that case, A is what we call zero order. So if x equals zero A, or did we say that the reaction is zero, zero in order? In other words, it doesn't matter how much A you have. You need it for the stoichiometry to work. You can't have the reaction continue if you run out of A, but it's not affecting the rate of the reaction. So an example of that would be, um, I don't know, let's say we have uh, people playing chess. We have two people playing chess that are both really slow playing chess. And as soon as they're done playing chess, they, the winner goes on and plays somebody else who is lightning fast. Does the person at the end, the lightning fast person, does it matter how fast they are? As long as they're faster than the first two. You're never gonna get a backlog of people getting through because the fastest person is sitting around waiting half the time, right? So you can have something that's necessary for a reaction that doesn't affect the rate. If the, if the slow step of a reaction is happening without A involved, you still need A, but it's not affecting the rate. If, it's, if Y is equal to one, anything to the one is what? It's like multiplying by one, right? It's the same thing. If Y is one, it means it's, so we call it first order. It means that your rate is proportional to that concentration. If you double your concentration of B, you double your rate. Z is a little bit weird. Or if we have a second order reaction. If we had something if we had a reaction that was A plus B plus C goes to D, if our rate just looked like our rate law looked like C squared, if you double your concentration of C, what does that do to your rate? It's a good guess, but that was just a pure guess. It's not the same. It 
keeps it the same. Let's call it, let's say that our initial concentration is X. Get rid of the guess. <laughs> so let's say rate one. <laughs> we have just some concentration. If we double X to test rate two, What does the rate do? Quadruples. Because you're squaring this concentration. So you doubled it and then you doubled it again because you're squaring this concentration, right? So rate is not always directly proportional to your concentration. If it's first order, it is. But these exponents here wind up playing a role. And again, that's something we're going to determine experimentally for this class. You're not going to be able to look at a reaction at this point and say, oh, it's balanced. I'm, I'm just going to guess that this is the rate law. We need to be able to show it and basically identify, is this exponent for each of these, is the exponent 1 or 0, 1, or 2? So now let's look at this graph is different. This is not rate versus concentration. This is concentration versus time. And this is for that same hydrogen plus iodine makes two hydroiodic acids. What is the rate representing? If we have just concentration versus time, the rate is negative change in Hydrogen concentration over change in time. Graphically, what is this? It's the slope. Who said that? Sorry, we don't raise your hand. Somebody said slope. That's exactly what it is. By looking at final minus initial and dividing by change in time, it's literally just rise over run. The same way you'd find the slope for a straight line in, in the first time you learned algebra. problem is, is that it's not a constant slope. That slope is changing because what's changing? Concentration. We're measuring, we're measuring our rate in terms of the concentration, but the concentration is changing based on the concentration. Who knows what math class that shows up in? Right. Keep going, keep going. Yeah. It is calculus, but we call the class differential equations. Mm -hmm. When, the, when a function depends on itself to know what's going to happen with the calculus, with the slope and everything, that's a differential equations issue. So the fact that our rate, so our rate is negative change in hydrogen concentration over change in time is equal to a constant times concentration of hydrogen. The Slope of our line is dependent on the variable itself, right? So basically, we get a more com complicated equation than we know to do it. And again, diff EQ is not required for this class. So I'm not going to have you do the actual integration for these problems. But because the concentration affects the rate, as the concentration goes down, the rate changes. So we don't get something as simple as a parabola or a straight line when it comes to predicting these rates, when it comes to predicting the slopes here. So in terms of instantaneous rate versus average, average rate is what we did before. We took two points and we did rise up a run. The instantaneous rate is if you took the derivative of this equation and figured out the slope at any given point. If you figure out the slope of the tangent line at any given point, which the nice thing about this for chemistry means we can actually do this experimentally. We can actually plot this data and then just literally just draw a straight line with a ruler that looks like it's the tangent line and use that to figure it out. We don't actually have to do the calculus because we have real values we can measure. 
All right. We'll talk more about this, especially getting into temperature later. Um, and your quiz will probably be mostly on electrochemistry this weekend. I might throw one question in here where I give you a rate law um, and ask you what order it is or something like that, or ask you to identify the various pieces. But in general, we're just going to be focused on the electrochemistry. Okay. And that will go live at 5 o'clock tonight. Let's go do something else for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>